charge letters, uh, their accuracy and its effect on clinical coding, and it's a completely audit cycle. So the objective of my audit was to look at the accuracy of primary diagnosis and comorbidities in uh, our discharge letter in corresponding to clinical coding, to identify other means of improving clinical coding and sustainability in our department, and to continue increasing awareness amongst medical professionals and the importance of accurate details in our discharge summary and the relation to clinical coding. So first and foremost, what is clinical coding? Clinical coding is a translation of all medical terminologies such as patient history, your diagnosis, investigation, and the reason for seeking medical attention into a code that is consistent and it's used um, not only nationally but also worldwide. Um, and what happens to these codes? It becomes a, what we call a healthcare resource group. So after the coders code every single detail of, your, of that admission, it gets grouped into a HRG and it generates a tariff and this becomes finance. Um, and things like comorbidities, and if your patient is very unwell and have a lot of comorbidities, this means higher need of care. Um, and, and this can influence the tariff and bring the tariff higher. Um, and it's not just all about money. So why is clinical coding so important? It's actually because once the coder codes the diagnosis, it uploads into the trust data and that becomes your data. So it, if you're going to do a research or an audit, that becomes your data pool. Um, it's information governance. Um, and most importantly, the R discharge summary is most of the time the only form of communication to secondary and primary care um, for the continuity of care to our patients. And if we don't write our discharge summary properly, um, it doesn't get follow up properly in the community and we have to think about our colleagues who are working in the community as well. Um, it has financial implications and funding allocations and our public health sector will use the information from the trust data um, to, to do their research, act on it, and then it has its consequences. So it's important to get it right from the start. So who are involved? All of us, junior doctors are the ones who type the most TTOs. Um, consultants, clinic coordinators, discharge team, <coughs> nurses, medical secretaries, medical students who will become doctors in a few years time, clinical coders, we've got a very good and hardworking team of clinical coders, um, the business intelligence managers and the finance sector. Um, so all our discharge letters should have a diagnosis and comorbidities that are up to date um, and the target is 100%. So the first audit in 2014, I reviewed a, fifth, uh, 50, a total of 50 discharge letters that was conducted across our seven pediatric wards. We com I compared it with um, the diagnosis written in the discharge summary and the ones that are inside the notes or the clerking sheets um, and then uh, look at its adherence to the ICD-10 nomenclature. Uh, as a result, 26 of them had inaccurate diagnosis and 12% had comorbidities that were not included in discharge letters at all. Um, these notes are then coded based on symptoms, which generates less income, and it's also very, very wrong, which I will show you in a few examples later on. So I'd like you to look at this slide. Um, most of you will probably be, be very familiar with the not to use part, the question mark, the, in, the word impression, most likely. And hopefully all of you will have a copy of these. Um, we're going to see a few examples by now. Um, and one thing to note is that clinical coders, they are not clinicians. While they have experience in a certain department coding, they are not authorized to translate for us. So writing things like low HB or down arrow K+, plus, while if, even if they do know what it means, they cannot translate it to anemia for you or hypokalemia. Therefore, it does not get coded. So this is the first example I have. This child was admitted crying and it's very clearly being treated for constipation. But because of that one question mark, the coders, even though they know it's constipation, they abide by a very strict rule and they cannot code it. So we lost this total of 56 pounds in this, but it's not just the money, but look at the diagnosis uploaded to the trust. It's completely different from constipation and it's not even a diagnosis. Um, it's just a symptom. Um, and then the next one, um, 
So think, well, well, think about the, the words that you can replace by with the do's and don'ts table. Um, so this one, it's a very nice, um, well, clinical history. However, it doesn't say DKA at all. A, a diagnosis shouldn't be that long, it's just two words. Um, but unfortunately for this case, um, it was, there was no mention of DKA mentioned, although he received treatment. So that's a 68 pound difference. Also, if you're doing, say, for example, a research on how good your community service are in prevention of type 1 diabetic patients in coming into hospital for DKA, you will miss this case because it hasn't been colored that way. Um, for this one, um, so the, the word likely due to viral upper respiratory infection can't be coded. Um, felt to be is one thing that can't, is, can't be coded either, so therefore it was coded based on um, the symptoms and there's a 114 pounds difference. Um, what I want to highlight here is the using DIB and lots of short form, or it is quick. Um, things like MS can mean mitral stenosis, can mean multiple sclerosis, and doesn't mean that you're in cardiology, that the patient can't have a neurological problem. So, so sometimes when the coders don't understand what your short form is, they will not code it because that's unprofessional, it's wrong. Um, so try not to use um, short terms, and also remember that the patient gets a copy of it, so if they don't understand what you put on it, they'll harass the GP as well. Um, so there are two examples. This one is query seizure under investigation, came in with a normal EEG, and it's going to have <coughs> an outpatient 24 hour EEG. It's all that question mark. And the second one is also a question mark atonic seizure. <coughs> and the difference of both cases was 117 pounds for the, that one, and this one is 117 pounds. However, think about this in a way where we see question mark as query, as in we don't really know, <coughs> and it needs further investigation. But in the public eye, question mark means I don't know. So lots of parents and patients now, will, they, they use Google a lot, and they'll look up a lot of things. And, and, and whilst they're in hospital, they probably won't focus on the word atonic. But once they go home and start digesting what happened in hospital, they'll start coming up with questions. And if you put question mark in front of them, the question, Exactly, did, did the doctor know what they were doing while we were in hospital? Because you, you sent us home with a question mark. Um, so, so they'll then go to their GP. And if you imagine you're in the GP spot and they come and ask you, oh my God, does my child have brain tumor? When, when, when am I getting the EEG appointment? When is the outpatient coming? You're putting our fellow colleagues in the community in a very difficult spot and a very awkward position because of that question mark of I don't know. But if we change the question mark into presume or treat it as a tonic seizure, then the GP can then say that actually the hospital is thinking along this line, we're then going to investigate. If you haven't heard back from the hospital in six to eight weeks, come back to me and we can then change it up. Um, but don't use the question mark because it, it, doesn't, it really doesn't look good. Um, just a couple more of examples. Um, in this case, I actually saw the notes, the consultant diagnosed the patient with asthma but the junior doctor who wrote it put likely asthma on the TTO. Unfortunately, the actual case bundle, the, the notes never got to the coders, so they did it based on the uh, main discharge summary itself, and there's a 300 pounds difference. And in this case, um, we, we see a lot of this in, the, in CAU and I'm sure pediatric ED, where we see a lot of children, the younger they are, with worrying symptoms of fever and a rash, we treat them for meningitis anyway, and then until the lumbar puncture and uh, blood cultures come back as negative, then we stop the antibiotics, but that can be two to three days. So while this one was ruled out, it doesn't mean that we haven't invested our resources on it. So, so yes, the main diagnosis is correct viral infection, but if you remove the question mark and say treated as meningococcal septicemia, the coders are able to pick this up as a secondary diagnosis um, and, and, we'll be, and the department will be able to reimburse. Uh, so to sum it up, we've got um, so all the seven examples became a total of 1,359 pounds different. Um, so how do we improve, just to remember the do's and don'ts, get the consultant and registrar on board, remind the junior doctors to look through the notes for appropriate diagnosis <coughs> and education for final medical students. So I gave a lecture to the graduating medical students of last year um, who will become FY1s in August. 
and they had very little understanding about codings and that how to write a discharge letter before the lecture and clearly they, it went up uh, significantly after the lecture. Um, and we did a re-audit in, in October 2015 with myself and Lloyd um, and using the same methodology of reviewing 78 discharge letters from November, October to November 2015. Um, and what we found is that we had a 17% significant improvement on codable diagnosis and our accuracy of comorbidities being captured has increased by 4%, um, and bringing us very close to the 100% target. Um, and for the first time, we've noted that consultants and registrars have stopped using the impression and the question marks, and, um, and I think this has significantly helped the juniors as well to, uh, to write a discharge letter. Now look, at this triangle is known for diagnosis. The coders know about this triangle, so on a busy and busy war round, this is the fastest way to write diagnosis um, of something. But be careful of drawing too many triangles because this means differential. And if you look on the don't side, you can't code differential diagnosis. Don't do that. Just draw one triangle is enough. Um, this is a little bit busy, but just to sum up the financial implication after discussing with the business intelligence manager and the pediatric side, we decided to average out the loss from last year um, and then underestimate it by two thirds and we over a one year period. And in 2014, we <coughs> lost about 330,000 pounds just on coding errors and discharge summary. And after a year of education, we brought the loss down to 114,000 uh, pounds. Um, so we actually cut our losses by about 200,000 pounds just by the do and don't um, of coding. It's actually on the, um, the do's and don'ts on every computer and every wall of our wards. Um, a bit of a discussion if you notice a significant impression, uh, decrease in impression and question mark use. Um, a lot of the time we saw in those that are uh, not correct are the words suspected non-accidental injury, which is in, <coughs> in essence income correct, but unfortunately uncodable. So it's worth working around with the coders because they follow a very strict rule and it can definitely be changed and treated as observable. And comorbidities definitely need to be consistently updated. So a few recommendations is the constant teaching and education. Um, and they are now a mandatory inclusion in the pediatric junior doctor handbook on every rotations. Um, as you may know, PEATS is going towards electronic um, records. So once it's well established, you might need to work with coders and IT to maybe do automatic coding as a, as a form of preventing people from using the don'ts, but we have to be careful about doing it. Um, that's the future plan, and, and definitely by electronic um, system, we can flag up previous medical history and comorbidities to be updated. Um, so this is the PDSA cycle. It's very re replicable over every department. I've certainly done it in general surgery, and it's very <coughs> easy to do. Um, and we're hoping to re-audit it again, just to make sure that we're on top of things and it's sus a sustainable um, uh, project. Um, so just to summarize, we've gone through why clinical coding is so important, um, and just remember the do's and don'ts. And if you if you intend on doing uh, audits of this in your department, feel free to contact any of us, um, and my email address is at the bottom of the PDSA cycle sheet. Thank you very much. Questions, please. That's a good piece of work. Uh, actually, it's, uh, I agree with you. Uh, I think what uh, your learning points are definitely transferable to other departments. Uh, I'll be slightly strict in terms of an audit, clinical audit lead, so don't um, don't think I'm being harsh uh, at the outset. So you mentioned the title as audit, yeah? yeah, and I can see this. Clearly, that your 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 slides did not mention a single word of standards. So, how could you justify your title as audit? When when I started, it was um, I when I started, I've never done an audit before. And the, when I went and met with the audit team, they said, "Let's just do a small audit, looking at it." And I realized there's very little data on coding everywhere else in the country, mm -hmm. and certainly there's no standard in here. It's just the coders complaining that, "Oh my God, this." This teacher could be written better, we could have earned more money, and then the clinicians go, I don't have time for this. And nobody can remember that list of words. 
So I definitely didn't have a standard, so I felt that it should be 100%, because it's a form of communication, it's not just money. So classically an audit is where the standards are well known, yes. and either it is evidence-based, consensus-based, or guide, guidance-based. Yes. Uh, whereas in this case, uh, it looks like people were not aware of the standards set by the physical coder, so there was a dichotomy there. Yeah. So how did you ensure yourself that you had standards before starting <coughs> the project to make sure that you were evaluating like for like? Um, I, I just took it as 100%, unfortunately, and then it turned out into a quality improvement project of some sort. Um, so, but It's a good work. So if you want to take this further as an audit, I think I'd, uh, I, I would like you to re uh, revisit the title again and, yes. and, and put it as a service evaluation yeah. of discharge letters to improve Definitely, clinical yeah. coding and financing. Yes. It doesn't come under the umbrella for audit. Yeah. But having said that, if you did want to make this an, as an audit project, what what would be the first uh, few steps that you need to do before going there? Um, I've liaised a lot with the coder side and see if they actually have a standard of their own. And they say we don't, we just code. And I've also spoken to finance and business managers and see whether is there any data. So I've gone on the <laughs> clinical librarians to look at and see if other hospitals have done similar work, but unfortunately it came up with none. So I think I just set my own standard this time. I think your dues may may conform to standards. So your do chart yeah, yeah. and don't. The don't is the education part. Yeah. The do's may conform if it is uh, transferable to all departments. Yes. The do's if worded as smart, specific, yeah. measurable, achievable, timely, realistic. Yeah. If, if they conform to the wording yeah. of the smart, then you could put them as standard. Is my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, definitely not that done, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No, well done. So the next one.